Hello again. I'm Reverend Mike Ritten, and I'm with the Bowman Charge of the United Methodist Church, located in Bowman, South Carolina. And this is my weekly sermon. It's a sermon for Sunday, August 30th. And I've entitled it, And That's the Truth. <laughs> so, let's open with a word of prayer. Almighty God, you have sent Jesus to take our nature upon himself and to be for us sign and savior. Grant that by the power of your spirit, Christ may be born within us today so that our ministry may be pleasing to you and helpful to your people. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you've had a good week. Um, here in South Carolina, it's been a little bit stormy. It's also been rather warm, but that's expected for this time of year. But we notice that the leaves are starting to fall off the trees, so hopefully the cooler weather is right around the corner. Scripture reading that I have chosen comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 21 through 28. Once again, that's Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Hear now the inspired, inerrant word of God. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever de desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who w shall not taste death till they meet or see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, once again, that came from Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter, verses 21 through 28. And my sermon again is titled, And That's the Truth. Lord, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to you this evening and May they be of inspiration to those who have gathered for the reading and hearing of your most holy word. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm somewhat amazed that Christianity is as popular as it is. Sometimes I wonder if people really understand it. From our gospel reading, it's seems that Peter certainly didn't understand it. He had some grand and glorious ideas about what Jesus was going to do, and he wanted to be a part of that grand and glorious enterprise. If we would have asked Peter what he expected of Jesus, I'm not sure how he would have answered, but I'm certain it would not have been the correct answer. Most likely, he would have said something that he expected Jesus to be 
like David, Israel's great king and Israel's greatest warrior. Israel was never a large country, but under David, it became a great country. The Israelites won battles, expanded their boundaries, and commanded respect. That's what people want, respect. However, in Jesus' day, it had been a very long time since Israel had commanded respect. In the years after David, Israel had been defeated, conquered, and humiliated. During Peter's lifetime, the Russian uh, Romans occupied Israel, collected taxes for the emperor, stamped Caesar's image on their coins, and the Jews did pretty much as they were told. That's not much of a way of life, is it? The Jews didn't expect that to go on forever, though. God had promised them a Messiah who would come from the house and lineage of David. And they could just imagine what that meant. This Messiah, the man like David, would lead them, would show the Romans a thing or two, would win their independence, and would make them great again. And most of all, Israel would be respected again with a capital R. They'd waited a long time for the Messiah, literally centuries. But now he was here. Peter could hardly wait. Peter was sure that the time had come. Just a little while ago, Jesus asked the disciples who they thought he was. And Peter had answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus didn't correct him but had said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That confirmed it for Peter. The Messiah was here, and he, Peter, had turned out to be the Master's right-hand man. He could hardly believe his great luck. However, then Jesus started to tell the disciples what they could expect. He didn't say anything about David. He didn't say anything about organizing an army. He didn't say anything about driving out the Romans. He didn't say anything about making Israel great. He didn't say anything that they expected him to say. What he did say was that he would undergo great suffering. He said that he would be killed. He also said that he would be raised on the third day, but I don't think Peter heard that. Peter heard the word killed and quit listening. Killed. The end. What kind of a Messiah is that? Peter figured that Jesus was just having a bad day. Something must be bothering him. He was feeling down, needed little encouragement until he got back on his feet. So Peter took Jesus aside to speak to him in private. He said to him, Far be it from you, Lord. This will never be done to you. Note that Peter calls Jesus Lord, yet he doesn't treat Jesus as Lord. Peter tells Jesus what must and must not happen. That isn't the way you talk to a Lord. However, Jesus wasn't having any of it. He turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Yet, Peter was setting his mind on divine things. He knew what the Messiah should do, and he was trying to help Jesus do it. The 
problem is that Peter didn't really understand. He had a vision, and he was trying to get Jesus to live up to it. Jesus, however, had his own vision. Jesus came to save the world, but he wasn't going to do it by raising an army. He was going to do it by dying on a cross. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been for Peter to understand? The Savior had finally come, but he'd come to die. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Then Jesus turned to the other disciples and said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I believe that the other disciples were as baffled as Peter was. What Jesus was introducing them to was the kingdom of God, where all the rules are upside down and backwards. It was just too much for them to understand. They wouldn't really understand it until they saw the risen Lord. It would only be after the resurrection that the disciples would begin to get a handle on what Jesus was saying now. Frankly, we have trouble understanding it too. We have our own beliefs, just like Peter did, and we want Jesus to bless those ideas. God helps those who help themselves, we say. That makes a great slogan, doesn't it? it? Has a nice ring to it. God helps those who help themselves. However, I have news for you. That isn't in the Bible. Nor is it what the Bible teaches. Not by a long shot. We have other beliefs that we want Jesus to bless. Work hard, we tell our kids. Stay in school. Keep your nose clean. Save your money. Invest wisely. Then someday you can retire and play golf or go fishing. Yet that isn't in the Bible either. Nor is it the kind of game plan that Jesus envisions for us. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Is that what we teach our kids? Probably not, but we need to hear it, and our children need to hear it as well. It isn't that Jesus wants us to be miserable. He just wants to show us the way to true joy. As one commentator put it, Jesus isn't anti our life. He's anti preoccupation with our life. Jesus warns that if we decide to live and only focus on self, Life will backfire on us. We'll find that we can't get enough of anything to fill the empty place at the core of our being. There won't be enough money, toys, sex, or power. There won't be enough of anything to fill that empty place at the core of our being. If we choose to spend our lives Filling that empty space will grow very weary feeding it and grow frustrated at never being full. Jesus warns us that 
if we spend our lives running after the things that we think will make us happy, we'll find ourselves in a rat race that goes on and on and on. At first, it'll seem exciting, but after a while, it'll become boring, and then it'll become downright tedious. At some point, we'll want to quit, but we'll find out it's the only game we know. Then, when the game finally stops, and trust me, the game will stop, we'll find ourselves in the most godless place we've ever lived. However, Jesus promises that if we're willing to lose our lives for his sake, if we're willing to go where he would have us go, and do what he would have us do, if we're willing to live our lives in devotion to God and in service to others, we'll find the kind of satisfaction that everyone wants, but only few people find. Jesus says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that's the truth. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. From the time we are small, we are told that we have to look out for number one. That nobody else is there to help us. That if we want to achieve anything, we're going to have to get it on our own. And this world teaches us that it's okay to stab others in the back in order to get ahead. It's okay to lie about others to make us look better. That's not what your holy word teaches. And so as Christians, we don't fit in. And unfortunately, there are many people who start down the path of Christianity, but once the world turns on them, they give up going down that path. So Lord, send us your Holy Spirit. Have the your spirit work with our spirit. Help us to remain true to the faith. Help us to be strong in our faith, no matter what the world throws at us. Because we know that by going down that path, as difficult as it will be, that it leads to your heavenly kingdom. And so, Lord, if there is anybody hearing this sermon who has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that you send your spirit to work with their spirit. For you do not want any of us to be condemned to hell for eternity. But it is our choice. We have free will. We can either accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and allow him to guide us in our lives. Or we can reject him. In the end... It's a decision between heaven and hell. And so, Lord, I pray that everybody will follow the path that leads to your heavenly kingdom. I ask these things and pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Well, thank you for tuning in. I hope you have a blessed week, and if you're not attending worship service in person, please remember to send your tithes and your offerings into your church secretary, or your church treasurer, I'm sorry. Sometimes the, tre the secretary is the treasurer. Anyway, make sure that you send those tithes and those offerings in, and don't forget about that Sunday school offering as well. Take care. God bless. God bless our nation. We pray for our nation that somehow all this evil and violence will stop. We need to become one nation under God once more. Again, take care. God bless. And I hope to see you back here next week.